Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on understanding attribute acceptance sampling, including Z1.4 and C equals zero plants. My name is Ricardo, and I am going to be your host today. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to thank you for being part. Now will be presented by Mr. Dan O'Leary. Uh, Dan O'Leary is president of Ombu Enterprises, LLC, an education, training, and consulting company focusing on operational excellence using analytical skills and a systems approach to operations management. Dan has more than 30 years' experience in quality, operations, and program management in regulated industries, including aviation, defense, medical devices, and clinical labs. He holds a master's degree in mathematics, is an ASQ certified biomedical auditor, quality auditor, quality engineer, reliability engineer, and Six Sigma black belt, and is certified by APICS in resource management. We are honored to have such a distinguished speaker, such as Dan O'Leary, with us to present this webinar. Before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outlined for this training session. This webinar is for 75 minutes duration. First, Dan will take you to today's webinar, highlighting the, um, the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. I'd just like to inform all our participants once again. Uh, once part of the teleconference, you have been placed on mute and will remain so till the Q&A begins towards the end of the webinar. This is for the purpose of avoiding discontinuity and for allowing our presenter to speak clearly so that everyone present can take maximum benefit from this webinar. We also request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. If uh, any questions do come up during the presentation itself, uh, do take a note of them, or you could send them over to me uh, via the chat panel, and uh, we shall address them during the Q&A. That's towards the end of the webinar. If for any reason you do get logged out of this training session or the teleconference, please do follow the same procedure to join back again. And now that we are all ready to start, I request uh, Mr. O'Leary to take it from here. Dan? Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on um, understanding uh, attribute acceptance sampling. So we're going to go through some material that will explain um, some of the common approaches to attribute acceptance sampling and give you an idea about um, how to use uh, the plans, particularly um, Z1.4, which uh, sometimes people find uh, complicated because it's got a lot of things in it. Now, in the lower right-hand corner of each slide is a slide number. So if you have a question about a particular slide, note the slide number as well. It'll be easy for me to go back to it um, during the question and answer period, and I can address your specific question uh, about that slide. So here's the material we're going to talk about. Um, we'll go through the outline. We're going to start with uh, the concept of sampling plans, and then we'll look at what goes on in uh, ANSI-ASQ Z1.4. Um, this is a very common uh, sampling plan, so we'll describe a little bit of its history, and uh, we'll make sure you know how to use it. Um, we'll look at something called single sampling plans, um, in which you take one sample. We'll look at double and multiple sampling plans, in which you take multiple uh, samples. Either you can take two samples or you can take more than two before you make a decision about accepting the lot. And um, these are techniques that are implemented in uh, Z1.4. And then we'll look at something that is uh, very popular, the so-called C equals zero sampling plans. Um, we'll explain why they're popular and why people like them and uh, some of the um, things that happen that you just need to be aware of um, if you utilize these kinds of plans. And then we'll move to um, summary and conclusions and open it up for questions. So we're going to look at some initial concepts of, uh, of sampling plans. Um, so here we have a typical application. <clears throat> you uh, just received a shipment of 5,000 widgets from a new supplier. Um, if the shipment is good enough, you want to put it in your inventory. So the question that you have to decide is, what's good enough? How do I know whether or not um, I I'm willing to put all 5,000 widgets um, into my inventory? So this is one of the things that we're going to discuss as an application of attribute sampling. So there's a few approaches you could use. Uh, we could consider um, looking at all 5,000 widgets. So we would generally tend to call this a 100% inspection. Or 
Um, we don't look at any of the widgets. We just put the whole shipment in stock. Um, that's zero percent inspection. Or we could look at some of them, and enough of them are good. We're going to um, keep the lot. We're going to put it in stock. And so this is acceptance sampling. We're not going to look at all of them, um, but we're going to look at a few. And based upon what we learned about the few that we look at, we're going to make a decision for all of the ones that we looked at and the ones we didn't look at. Um, so this is the essence of, of acceptance sampling. And so in these sampling plans, we need to know a few things. How many to inspect or test? In other words, how many are we going to look at? Um, how do we distinguish good from bad? Um, and so we need to take all the ones we look at and classify them as either good or bad. And we'll get into the t technical quality terms here in a few moments. Um, and then how many good ones are enough? Right? So if we know that we're going to look at, um, say, 20, um, is um, 15 good ones and five bad ones okay or not? So that's the kind of uh, information that we need in order to make a decision, and that's what we're going to get out of the sampling plans. So first, though, we need to look at a couple of kinds of information. Uh, first, attributes. So we're going to classify things um, using attributes. So a stoplight could be uh, one, any one of three colors, red, yellow, or green. So that's an attribute for the color of the stoplight. Um, the weather could be sunny or cloudy or raining or snowing. Um, I live in New England. It can do all of those at the same time. Um, but those are attributes for weather. A park can be conforming or non-conforming, um, and that's the situation that we typically find um, in quality assurance and quality control. On the other hand, we sometimes have variables. These are things that we're going to measure using a scale. Um, a temperature um, could, for example, be 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we could have uh, tire pressure in a car at 37 pounds per square inch, or we could measure a critical dimension on a part, um, and for that given part, maybe it's 3.47 inches. So those are variables. Typically, we measure variables on a scale, and we're going to make a distinction between attributes and variables, and we're going to do attribute sampling in this uh, webinar today. Um, but we can convert variables to attributes, um, and often we do that with a specification. So here's an example in which um, we have an, an important dimension. Um, it's got a specification of 3.5 plus or minus 0.1 inches. So what that tells us is that as long as we're between um, 3.4 and 3.6 inches on this dimension, we'll classify the part as conforming. And if we're outside um, those limits, we'll classify the part as non-conforming. Um, so you can see our um, piece A here um, is conforming because it's between the lower spec limit and the upper spec limit. But we can also see that piece B is non-conforming. It's below the lower specification limit. So what we've done is taken uh, this measurement, which uh, we've measured in inches. So we've um, measured on a variable scale. And then we've applied the specification, the upper and lower spec limits. And we classified the part as uh, on an attribute scale, as either conforming or non-conforming. So this is an example of how we're going to convert variables into attributes. Now, we need to talk about language. Um, and I avoided this earlier by uh, talking about good and bad parts. Um, but one of the things that you need to worry about is uh, use of the words defect and defective. Um, they are technical terms in the quality profession with very specific meanings. But unfortunately, they're also technical terms in product liability, and they could have a very different meaning in product liability. In colloquial language, um, they could have yet again a different meaning. So we as quality professionals can talk about something as, um, as being defective, meaning that it doesn't match the specifications. If our company ever ends up in a lawsuit, and we have to um, produce all of this documentation, and it says, you know, we produced 10% um, defective items in the last year, that is going to um, ring differently with a jury than with a quality professional. So what I encourage is that from now on we use the words nonconformances and nonconforming and avoid the terms defect and defective. And that's starting to get into a lot of the specifications, um, and it's a good practice um, because it actually does describe in a more, um, um, in a better manner, 
um, this concept of not being inside or out, inside a specification. So um, I'm going to use nonconformances and nonconforming um, for the rest of the talk, I hope. So uh, we're going to look at two published attribute sampling plans. Um, ANSI ASQ Z1.4 is the classic plan. Um, it evolved from MIL standard 105, and oftentimes you'll hear people talk about um, MIL standard 105, but um, we'll give you a little bit of history. Um, the other plan that I'm going to discuss is the C equals zeros plans, and there's a variety of them around, um, but the one I'm going to discuss is called Zero Acceptance Number Sampling Plans um, by Sequela, and it's published by the American Society for Quality, and you can buy it in a number of places, including uh, from the ASQ bookstore. So we'll discuss um, exactly how these two plans work, and we'll talk about what's the same and what's different um, between the two plans. So there are some process steps where acceptance sampling is common. So for the most common place is incoming inspection, and that's the example um, that we're going to use. A supplier provides a shipment, and we want to judge its quality level before we put it into stock. That was the situation I'd set up earlier. So um, we're going to look at acceptance sampling um, as, in, as incoming material, but you don't have to think of it as material coming from an external supplier. It could be material that's coming to your process from another process inside the same um, factory. So it's, um, it really has this question of process to process as opposed to company to company, but we most often see it at incoming inspection. Uh, sometimes we do acceptance sampling with rectifying inspection, and we'll talk about what that means, but basically um, we're going to make a decision to accept or reject a lot, and the rejected lots are going to be inspected 100%, um, and that's going to give us some interesting characteristics after the inspection, so we'll talk about what those mean. The other case um, is destructive testing. Um, here, sampling plan is the only way you can go, unless you don't sample at all, you don't look at any parts, because if you did 100% inspection, you wouldn't have any product left to ship. So destructive testing is a very common application of, uh, of attribute sampling. Now, acceptance sampling isn't always appropriate. So there are cases in which we don't want to do it. Acceptance sampling is not process control, for example. If you want to control a process, there are much better ways. Um, one of them is statistical process control. And you can use either attribute or, sam or um, variables, uh, SPC charts. But if you're trying to control a process, that's the right tool, not sampling. Um, so think of SPC as the method to control the process and acceptance sampling as insurance. And this is why we often see it between um, a supplier, an external supplier, and a, and a customer. As an external supplier, we probably aren't running their SPC process, although we might be getting information from them. Um, but we want to make sure that their processes are staying in control, so we might use acceptance sampling at our end just to give us the insurance that we want. So you may have suppliers that are practicing uh, solid SPC techniques. You still might want the little extra insurance that comes from acceptance sampling. My analogy is that you might practice good driving techniques, but just because you think you're a good driver, you don't go out and cancel your insurance policy. You still want the insurance as well. So you've got to have to make some decisions about um, using attribute acceptance sampling um, in these kinds of cases. So now we're going to look at our single sample um, example. So we're going to start with an exercise, and we're going to explain how it works. Um, so your supplier, this is a slightly different situation than one I set up initially. Your supplier submits a lot of 150 widgets, and you subject it to acceptance sampling by attributes. So the inspection plan is to select 20 widgets at random, um, and this is how you're going to make your decision. If two or fewer are nonconforming, um, that is zero, one, or two, then you're going to accept the whole lot. If three or more are nonconforming, then you're going to reject the whole lot. So in symbols, um, capital N tells us the lot size, 150 widgets. Lowercase n tells us the sample size. In this case, it's 20. C tells us the acceptance number. We're going to accept on two or fewer. R tells us the reject number. We're going to reject on three or more. 
And this turns out to be a plan out of um, Z1.4, and so we're going to examine it in detail. It's going to be um, our example as to as to what's going on with uh, these these sampling plans in Z1.4. So here's our basic approach. We're going to select a sim a single simple random sample. Um, we're only going to take one sample. It's going to be 20 widgets. And then we're going to classify each widget in the sample as conforming or non-conforming. Now, we might have a lot of characteristics that we're interested in. Um, some of them might be measurements and so on. So generally, um, what's going to happen if we take a measurement, that will be variables. We'll convert it to the attributes of conforming and non-conforming and make our decision. We're going to count the number of non-conforming widget, widgets. And then we're going to make the decision to accept or reject the shipment. And then we're going to record the results. So this is a, going to create a quality record. So whenever we do this sampling, we want to write down the lot size, the number of uh, items in the sample, the decision rules for the sampling plan, how many non-conforming items we got, what, and what the results were. So these are standard things you'd want to include in a, in a quality record. All right, so we're going to look at ANSI ASQ Z1.4. Um, so this is the old MIL standard 105, and you'll hear people often talk about it. Um, the most recently published is MIL standard 105E, um, and so E is the revision letter. And then, um, and this was a military standard. So they then came along, the Department of Defense came along with Notice 1, which canceled the standard and told people to use um, ANSI ASQC Z1.4 1993. Now, Today's American Society for Quality used to be the American Society for Quality Control, so that's where the ASQC comes from. Um, today, it's ANSI ASQ Z1.4, and the current version is the 2008 version. So if you want to buy it, you get the 2008 version. It hasn't changed. What happens is that they um, reaffirm the standard every five years. They haven't made any major changes in it since the MIL standard 105E days. Now, oftentimes people in this webinar come from the medical device field, um, and so it's very important to understand how FDA views this standard. So they have a technique called um, recognition. So they may recognize general consensus standards, and they recognize uh, ANSI-ASQ Z1.4, the 2008 version, as a general consensus standard. Um, and what they say here is the extent of recognition is the use of all single, double, and multiple sampling plans according to the standard switching rules. Now, we're going to talk about switching rules and how they work. Um, but FDA expects you to implement the switching rules. And I'm going to make the case that it's really valuable if you implement the switching rules because you can get a lot of value out of the information it provides, and you can reduce your um, cost of sampling at the same time. So I'm going to make the case before we're done today that you implement the switching rules. Um, and it's making decisions on a continuous stream of lots for a specified acceptance quality limit, AQL. So we'll talk about what AQL means um, when we get to that portion um, of, of the presentation. So here's how we get started. Um, to correctly use Z1.4, you need to know five things. And I'm going to take you through the five things and who determines them typically and what they mean. So you need to know the lot size. You need to know something called the inspection level. You need to make a decision about whether you're doing single, double, or multiple sampling. You need the acceptance history of this part from this supplier um, because that's how we're going to determine the switching rules. Uh, and when to apply them. And we're going to need something called the AQL, the acceptable quality level. And we'll define what that means um, before we're done. Um, so here's a flow of information. Um, and what I would suggest is that if you don't have a copy of Z1.4 in front of you, and I don't expect that you do, um, that you take these slides and you go back and you work this example and you understand how to work your way through uh, Z1.4. And if you have any questions, contact me through Global Compliance Panel, and I'll be happy to, um, to answer any questions about how to do this. Sometimes it gets complicated. There's a few confusing things. So if it's not obvious, feel free to contact me. So flow of information. Um, typically, purchasing um, materials management is going to determine the lot size. So they're going to tell you um, 
by placing a purchase order, how many pieces are going to come in at your receiving dock, and therefore how many pieces are going to arrive at your incoming inspection station. So purchasing is typically going to determine the lot size. The quality engineer is typically going to determine the inspection level, and we'll talk about what that means, whether you're using single, double, or multiple sampling, and the AQL. And the lot history is going to determine the switching rules, and you'll be in one of basically three states, normal, reduced, or tightened. So this is where all this information is going to come from. And as we work our way through this information, eventually we'll come down to a sampling plan that will tell us how many pieces to pick in the sample, what the uh, accept number is, and what the reject number is. Um, and that's what we're going to get out of uh, Z1.4. So the lot size. Uh, lot size is the number of items received at one time from the supplier. So at incoming inspection, the way to think about this is the quantity on the pack slip. So this is what was received on the receiving dock, and it's what the receiving clerk transfers into the incoming inspection station. So the purchase order or the contract is typically going to set the lot size. So in our example, in the yellow box, um, we received 150 pieces, so N is 150. Uh, inspection level. This is going to determine um, something about how the lot size and the sample sizes are related. Um, and it's a little technical, and, we'll, um, and you need to understand operating characteristic curves, which we'll explain in this webinar. But uh, Z1.4 provides uh, seven different levels, S1, S2, S3, S4, and 1, 2, and 3. And unless you have a really compelling reason to do something else, you always pick level two. Now, the other plans, especially the, the ones with S's, are called special plans. And if you're doing um, um, destructive testing on very expensive parts, you might pick one of the special plans. But basically, you need to uh, just stick with level two unless you understand uh, what the risks are associated with picking one of the other ones. The quality engineer should understand these things, and so the quality engineer is going to set the inspection level. And as I say, always default to, uh, to level two. The code letter um, is going to come from table one in the standard. So if you know the inspection level, so we're going to assume it's two in this case, um, and um, you know the lot size, then you're going to go into this table and it's going to give you something called a code letter. So in level two, lot size of 150 gives you a code letter of F. And this is going to give us, this doesn't mean anything other than it tells us how to enter some of the tables that come later. Um, we're going to do, in this example, single sampling. So we're going to go into table two. Um, and table two is going to have some subtables as well. So we decided on single sampling. Um, and what's going to happen is that um, if we had chosen double sampling, there may be some advantage we have in terms of the total lot size we have to inspect. And we'll look at that in double sampling. But um, right now we're going to go into uh, single sampling. So we're going to use table two. Um, and then um, we need to know the lot history. So Z1.4 has a set of switching rules. And based on the lot history, we're going to inspect the same amount that we did when we initially started. So that's called normal sampling. If we have a part with a good history, we can go to reduced, and we'll define what good history means. And if we have a lot, a part with bad history, a poor quality, um, we're going to go to tightened. And we'll explain um, what all of those mean when we look at the switching rules. So basically, our inspection plan can be in four states, uh, inspection system. So the system could be in normal, reduced, tightened. And there's a fourth state um, in which you discontinue inspection. You're not getting any value out of inspection. Um, the lot history tells you that the quality is really poor, so you're not getting an adequate level of assurance. Um, you've got too much risk. So the plan can, ha can tell you to discontinue uh, sampling inspection. So it can be in one of four states. It's normally going to switch between normal, reduced, or tightened. We need something called the AQL. Um, and we'll define it um, shortly, but um, it's something that the quality engineer is going to set. So Z1.4 uses the AQL to index the sampling plans. 
So we want the supplier's process average to be as low as possible, and we want it to be certainly well below the AQL that we pick. To set up our example, we're going to use an AQL of 4, um, and we'll ex explain what this means um, in a moment, But we, where we need a lot of diagrams um, and pictures. But right now, we're going to use an AQL of 4. So now we have our sampling plans. Um, the type and history gets us to the right table. So we um, started in table one, got the code letter, it moved us to table two. We're in normal inspection, so it's going to move us to table 2A. We're going to um, use an AQL of 4.0. So we're going to enter the table with the code letter on the left and the AQL at the top. And we're going to pick a sampling plan. And so this is going to tell us that we want a sample size of 20, accept on two, reject on three. And so that was the example that we set up initially. So this is how we're going to determine our sampling plan by working our way through, um, through the tables. Now, sometimes um, you can get combinations of, uh, code, of uh, levels and AQLs, that is code letters, um, that don't have a legitimate plan. And what you find in the tables is, is big arrows that either move you up in the table or down in the table till you get a legitimate uh, plan. These things are called sliders. Um, and so if you, had, uh, if you land on one of those, you move either up to the line where the slider ends, it's obvious in the table, or you move down, and that's the plan that you use. Now, um, changing the lot size. So we just gave you an example of, in which we had a lot size of 20. Um, and your supplier has been shipping you 150 units in the lot uh, based on the purchase order for a long time. And so here's this hypothetical case. Your supplier calls the buyer and says, you know, we're near the end of this raw material run, and we made 160 widgets instead of 150. We're going to start um, a new batch of raw material. Uh, why don't I ship you all 160 from the same lot of raw material now, um, and then when we uh, get the next order, we can start clean. So the buyer, so the, sell, the buyer agrees, and so the supplier ships 160. Um, this is actually going to change our sampling plan when we move from 150 to 160. Um, before we had to sample 20 pieces. Now, because we're at 160, we're going to have to sample 32 pieces. So our sampling cost went up by 12 pieces because we changed the lot size by 10 pieces. So you need to understand a little bit about what's going on. And if these are very costly inspections, you want to make sure that your purchasing people understand um, the implications of making these decisions. If they're not particularly expensive um, inspections, then it's probably not going to be a big deal. So you have to decide on the economy based upon your own situation. So here's the, the um, switching rules. When you start, you start at normal. And if you get um, 10 lots out of 10 in a row, right? so this is 10 out of 10, um, you can switch to reduce sampling. And if you switch to reduce sampling, your sample size goes down. There's savings associated um, with switching to reduce sampling. If you reject one out of one, that is if you reject a lot, you switch back to normal. If you're in normal and two out of five lots are rejected, you move to tighten inspection. If you're in tighten inspection, your sample size goes up. Um, what this means is you've got a little bit of bad history here, and you want to make sure that you're um, getting the protection that you expect. If you're in Titan inspection and you get five out of five in a row, you can switch back to normal. Um, or if you're in Titan inspection and you reject 10 out of 10, what this is telling you is stop and sampling. It isn't getting you anything. There's too much risk associated with it. Now, this is really valuable information. If you're in a solid supplier management program, um, what you would like to see is that all of your combinations of parts and suppliers um, switch themselves down to reduced inspection. This tells you that you're getting um, good quality from your suppliers, and you've demonstrated it through the sampling plan. So your goal is to um, make is to work with your suppliers to get them to reduced inspection. That um, buys you the same amount of insurance with less cost. On the other hand, if you're having problems with the supplier, 
then they'll st stay in normal or actually switch up into tightened. If a supplier switches up into tightened um, over a part, that's where you want to start taking um, solid action with that supplier. You want to make sure that you understand what's going on with that supplier's process because that process is not providing you the level of quality that you need to operate your plant. So you should be focusing your supplier management resources on the suppliers and parts that have switched up into tightened. Um, so by utilizing the switching rules, and a lot of people don't like to do it because it looks like there's too much administrative overhead, but if you're utilizing the switching rules, you can actually get some good value um, out of the information that you learn. You want to get everybody to reduce because you're getting good quality out of those suppliers. You want to focus your supplier management and supplier improvement efforts on the suppliers that um, have gone up into tightened. And if you've got a supplier that's staying in normal for a long period of time, you want to watch that because that means they're switching back and forth and their um, su supplier quality is moving around. So you want to watch that. So this figure tells you what's going on in the switching rules, and it's, there's a similar picture in um, Z1.4. All right, so we've talked about how to use Z1.4. Now we're going to look at some common concepts um, in sampling. These are some issues that come up once in a while. Um, when we looked at the widget sample, we didn't put them back um, during sampling. That is, we didn't replace them. What that means is that we are sampling without replacement. So if the sampling plan says take 20 pieces, we take all 20 pieces and we inspect them and we don't put any of them back until we're ready to make the decision on the lot. So it isn't like we take one, inspect it, put it back in, mix up the parts and take another one. So that would be sampling um, um, with replacement. So we're sampling without replacement. Um, this is the way the system is set up, um, and if you do put them back and resample, that changes all the underlying statistics and things don't work right anymore. Um, there's something called uh, stratified sampling. Um, so let's assume a lot has got n items. In a simple random sample, every piece in the lot is equal probability of being picked. In a stratified sample, we're going to divide the lot into groups called strata, and then we're going to sample out of the um, out of one and only one stratum, or we're going to take an item out of one and only one stratum. So what this, this means is that not every piece has got equal probability of being picked, um, and so that changes the underlying statistics. So here's an example. Uh, we receive a shipment of 5,000 AAA batteries and 50 boxes of 100 each. First you take a sample of a box, and then you take a sample of the batteries in the box. So this is a stratified sample. It changes the probabilities. In practice, it doesn't change it typically that much that you really need to worry about it, but you just need to be aware um, that this is what's going on and it's not the way the plans were defined. So some picky statistician or FDA inspector could, uh, could call you on it. But basically, um, stratified sampling and, and simple sampling um, in this case are probably going to give you essentially the same results. In the end, you're going to make the same decision, except to reject the lot. There would be a rare case where um, the decision you make would be different. So here's our conventions. Unless we say otherwise, um, sampling is performed without replacement. That is, we don't put the parts back. And sampling is a simple random sample. Every um, piece in the lot has equal probability of being picked. Now we're going to look at this underlying statistical distribution, the binomial. I'm going to introduce you to it. We're not going to do a lot of um, statistical issues or math, but um, you need to understand what's going on here just because it has some impact on how these plans work. So we're going to start with this concept of a Bernoulli trial. Um, so Bernoulli trials are a sequence of n independent trials where each trial has only two possible outcomes. Um, and the only two is the important part here. So example, we're going to flip a coin 50 times. So this is a sequence of trials. Um, the sequence is 50 trials long. The trials are independent because the coin doesn't remember the previous trial. And the only outcome in each trial is a head or a tail. So this is an example of a Bernoulli trial. Now, when we think about classifying our parts as attributes, um, what we would like to think is that when we take the sample, um, we're going to classify things into attributes, conforming or non-conforming. And what we classify the first piece as 
um, is independent of how we classify the second piece. So this is like flipping a coin, um, only we have different probabilities of getting conforming and non-conforming than the 50-50 we have for heads or tails. But this is the underlying concept um, that makes all of this work. So this is going to give us something called the binomial distribution. The Bernoulli trial is only two possible outcomes. One outcome is called success with probability P. The other one is called failure with probability Q. Um, and the way these plans are set up, success means finding a non-conforming item in the sample. So here's the formula at the bottom of the page for the binomial distribution. We're not going to look at it any further. Um, it's there for reference. It's built in as, an, as a function in Excel, so if you really wanted to play with it, um, here's how it works. So I've given you a little graph here that um, answers the question, uh, what is the probability of exactly zero successes, one success, and so on? So that's what's in the bar graph down here at the, at the bottom. Um, and what I did was drew this um, bar graph using um, Excel, and the formula in Excel, the function is this binomial distribution. Um, if cumulative is um, true, then it adds up um, all the um, cases. If cumulative is false, it gives you the, the picture that we've shown here. So if you're interested, you can go into Excel and, and play with this a little bit. All right, so now we're going to talk about single sampling plans. Uh, and we know how to determine at least one set of single sampling plans out of Z1.4. So we're going to make some distinctions here. In a single sampling plan, we're going to take one sample, select it at random, and we're going to make an accept-reject decision based upon the sample. Um, in a double sampling plan, we're going to take one sample and make a decision, but we've got three choices for the decision. We could accept a lot, we could reject a lot, or we could go back and take a second sample. So we have three choices, um, and if there's a second sample, then at the end of the second sample, we're going to be able to make an accept-reject decision. So sometimes we can make it on the first of two samples, sometimes we need both samples. In multiple sampling plans, um, there could be even more than two samples involved, and Z1.4 um, allows up to seven different samples before you can make a decision. So it gets a little complicated um, if you use m multiple sampling plans in Z1.4. So now we're going to look at um, the AQL concept. AQL is the poorest level of quality in percent nonconforming that my process can tolerate. So I'm the consumer. I'm getting these materials from the supplier, who could be internal or could be external. Um, and I say, what's the worst case that I can stand uh, in order to operate my process successfully? You know, so if he makes 1% of the things um, are nonconforming, you know, maybe that's not so bad in my particular process. You know, maybe I need tighter quality than that. Um, but the question I'm trying to answer is, what's the worst that I can stand? Um, so the input is, um, the supplier is uh, going to produce the products in lots. They're going to use essentially the same production process for each lot. Um, and the supplier's production process needs to run as well as possible. So the um, process average nonconforming is as low as possible. That's what we're looking for. Now, that's the kind of things you would learn if you were using statistical process control. So then we say, what's the poorest level of quality? Um, so that I can stand, that's the acceptable quality level. So what we mean here is um, it's a criterion against which we are going to, um, to judge lots. It's going to help us set up the acceptance um, criteria. It's going to help us determine the sampling plan. AQL is not a specification. It doesn't define where the process has to operate. It doesn't tell us anything about the product. It does not knowingly allow the supplier to submit nonconforming product. Just because we say an AQL is 1%, that's a number that's going to help us pick a sampling plan. It doesn't say we would be happy if your process ran at 1% nonconforming. Um, it does not provide a license to stop continuous improvement activities. You need to have your suppliers um, continually improving their process. 
And if they are, you'll see the evidence in Z1.4 because your suppliers uh, will start to move down to reduced inspection. So, oh, this didn't come out so well. Um, so here's here's what's going on. Um, the some of the text in this box rotated when it got into um, in, into WebEx. So the producer is supposed to be managing their production process, and they should be using control methods. And since we're talking about attributes, I'm suggesting that they use a, a P chart um, and use something called the standard given approach to set the control limits. Um, and I've given you the um, formula here for the control limits. On the right-hand side, we've got the consumer. They have an acceptance process. This is where they're buying their insurance. Um, they're going to have a control method, um, which is going to be attribute sampling. And they're going to use an AQL of, of 4%. So my rule of thumb is um, if you're using an AQL of 4%, your supplier's process target should be half of that or better. That is, in smaller numbers are better. So we're going to use um, Z1.4 single sampling level two. So this is how we might see the SPC techniques used to control the process line up with what I'm going to call the, the insurance techniques um, of acceptance sampling, um, particularly using Z1.4. So what does the AQL mean? If the supplier's process average is below the AQL, I as the consumer will are willing to accept all of the ship lots. That's what I've said with AQL. If your process operates better than my AQL, then I'm willing to take all of the lots that you ship me. If your process work is operates worse than the AQL, then I'm not going to take anything from you. I'm going to reject all the lots. And if that were the case, we'd have this so-called ideal OC curve. So the ideal OC curve says below the AQL, which is 4% in this case, um, I'm willing to accept all of the lots. If your process runs above 4%, I'm not willing to take anything from that process. My um, acceptance probability drops to zero. So that's what gives us this very square looking um, operating characteristic curve. Now, we'll never get there with sampling. Um, and so here's some examples of what the curve might look like with, with sampling plans. So if we increase the sample size and keep the acceptance number proportional, um, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to, to this ideal curve. Right? So what that means is as the sample size gets closer to 100% inspection, the curve is going to get closer and closer to the ideal case. Um, if we increase the acceptance number, uh, keeping the sample size the same, uh, we're also going to get closer and closer and closer to this ideal curve. So we've got some um, levers that we can use to control the shape of this curve. And basically, this curve is going to tell us what's going on. It's going to describe um, the way this plan is going to operate by telling us how the supplier's quality, which is on the x-axis, relates to my probability of accepting lots out of that process, which is on the y-axis. Now. We don't have an ideal OC curve, so some things could happen. Um, we could um, have a, a producer make a lot that conforms. Um, you know, the lots are coming out of a process that has an acceptable level, and we accept those lots, so that's okay. That's exactly what we'd like to have happen. We also have a case where the lots don't conform, and we reject them. That's okay. That's exactly what we want to have happen. But there's two other cases. We can have a lot that conforms, and through the luck of the draw, we reject it with the sampling plan. Um, so that's called producer's risk. Or we can have a lot that doesn't conform, and through the luck of the draw, we don't happen to see enough non-conforming pieces, and we accept a lot. That's called the consumer's risk. So these are risk values that we can assign to the operating characteristic curve. And here's a picture of how they work. And we've got a little bit of math on the, on the side, and I'm not going to worry too much about the math. What I'm really interested in here is that you understand the picture. So this is the operating characteristic curve. And if I'm operating a process at this level, and let's say it's right around 4%, because that's the example that I keep picking, um, what this says is if my supplier is operating a process at about 4% nonconforming, I'm going to accept about um, 96% of the lots that come out of that process. All right? So this um, defines the so-called producer's 
um, risk. This defines the so-called consumer's risk, um, the probability of accepting bad lots um, or accepting lots from a, from a process that um, isn't operating at the point that I'm interested in. So we need to take some conventions. Um, there's a couple of things that are going on here. Um, normally, these points, alpha and beta, um, are set at 5%. And so with, with those alpha and beta points, I can get um, different values of um, probability of acceptance. And they are sometimes called um, AQL and RQL. So this is slightly different meaning than it for AQL than we saw in Z1.4. Um, they're related. But, um, a, but Z1.4 uses the AQL to index the um, sampling plans. So it doesn't adopt these conventions. Or I can set alpha and beta um, at different levels um, of 5% and 10%. So I can set those risks anywhere I want, and I can find those points um, on the curve, and, I, and it can tell me how this plan is going to operate. So here's the points that are named. So in the second sense of AQL, Here's my AQL, and here's the probability of accepting lots at that AQL. So what this means is, for a long stream of lots, if this number is, say, 96, that says that 96% of the lots will be accepted um, from a process that's operating at the AQL point. Now, what I really want, of course, is that my supplier operates well below the AQL point. The probability of acceptance goes up and um, things, look, um, things look good in that process. So there's a lot going on with these attribute sampling plans, and so we often describe them with a set of curves. So we talked about the operating characteristic curve. For a given quality level, it's going to tell us the probability of acceptance. There's also something called the average sample number curve. It's the expected number of items we're going to sample. So remember, if we have a double sampling plan, we might be able to make a decision on the first lot, on the, the first half of the sample, um, or we might have to move to the second half of the sample. So it may very well be that, on average, um, we can predict the number of pieces we're going to have to take. Sometimes we take one, sometimes we have to take two. So we, we can figure out what that, those probabilities are. Um, and then we're going to look at these two average outgoing quality and average total inspection curves. These show up with rectifying inspection. Um, so the average outgoing quality tells us what the process outgoing quality looks like if we apply acceptance sampling. So this is a case in which we're going to um, take lots in from the process. We're going to make an accept-reject decision on each lot. And if we reject it, we're going to inspect it 100% and replace or repair any non-conforming items. Um, and if we do that, um, then what's going to happen is because we've replaced or repaired the non-conforming items, what comes out of this inspection step is going to look much better um, than what comes in. So the average outgoing quality um, is going to be a curve that tells us the relationship between the two. And then we can also predict the total, no the average number of items we're going to have to inspect um, if we implement um, that plan. So here's rectifying inspection. Uh, for every lot submitted, we're going to accept or reject. Um, the accepted lots go on to stock. Uh, what do we do with the rejected lots? Well, if we subject them to 100% inspection and replace any of the non-conforming units, then what's going to happen is the outgoing quality from this inspection step is going to be better than the incoming quality. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves the financial questions. Um, how many are we going to inspect on average? And what quality improvement um, do we get by applying this technique? Now. You use this technique if your process is not capable, right? A capable process is not going to produce. A capable process is going to operate at an acceptable level. If you're working on process improvement and you don't have a process that is capable, it's not operating at an acceptable level, you can protect the consumer by using um, this rectifying inspection technique. So I don't recommend it in all cases, but it is a way to protect your customer against your uncapable processes until you can get the processes under control and capable. So we're going to screen um, the sample. We're going to screen the rejected lots. That means we're going to replace all of the nonconforming units with conforming ones. 
Um, and the average outgoing quality, I've given you the equation that tells you how to do it here, um, the average outgoing quality is this curve. And what's going to happen is if the average, if the incoming quality, which is on the x-axis, um, is good, then we're not going to reject very many lots. Um, and so we're going to have good quality going out. Um, as the quality gets worse and worse and worse, moving to the right, the outgoing quality is going to go up until it finally peaks and comes back down again. What's going on here is that as the quality gets worse and worse, we're actually going to start rejecting more lots. We're going to repair or replace all of the non-conforming items in those lots, and the outgoing quality is going to get better. So we've got a curve that's got a peak. The peak is called the um, average outgoing quality limit. So the limit is, is this peak. It's as bad as it gets with, um, with this technique. And we can quantify these using the binomial distribution. Um, and I drew all these graphs in, in Excel, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. We can also ask the question, um, how many do we have to inspect if we are applying this plan? Um, and so here's what's going on. Um, this is the average total inspected curve. Now, the sample size is fixed. It's always 20. So this means we're always going to inspect 20 no matter what. Um, and then what happens is the quality gets worse and worse and worse. We inspect more and more and more and more until finally we end up doing essentially 100% inspection. So that's what this curve um, is telling us. And we can utilize this curve to make estimates about what our total inspection costs um, are going to be. Um, average sample number, if we only have a single sample, then we're always going to pick the same sample size, uh, 20 in this case. So it's going to be a constant regardless of the quality. If we had a double sampling plan, what's going to happen is that um, in this intermediate case right around in here, what's going to happen is sometimes we have to go to the double sample to take the second sample. And so the curve will go up. And then as the quality gets worse, uh, we're going to make reject decisions on the first sample, and it comes back down again. All right, so we're going to look at double and multiple sampling plans in Z1.4. Um, double sampling can reduce the sample size and thereby reduce cost. So it reduces the sample size because if we can make the decision on the first sample, we don't have to inspect as many. So in Z1.4, um, if we have a single sampling plan, we're going to pick a certain sample size. If we had the corresponding double sampling plan, each one of those samples, remember we could potentially take two, is only going to be about 62.5% of the single sample size. Um, so remember we looked at this case where n equals 4, AQL of 4%. Code letter uh, table 1 gives, a, gives us a code letter of F. Um, if we go to normal double sampling, we get a sample size of 13 for the first sample and a sample size of 13 for the second sample. If we can make the decision on the first sample, we only have to look at 13 pieces. If we were doing single sampling, we'd have to look at 20 pieces before we could make the decision. So um, this is good news. If our incoming quality is bad, we only have to look at 13 pieces, and we can make the reject decision uh, based upon those 13. There's some intermediate points where we're going to have to take the second sample before we can make the decision. In those cases, we look at a total of 26. It turns out that because of um, we're expecting this intermediate quality to not happen very often, um, in general, if we go to double sampling, we can reduce the total cost of sampling because we can make our decisions on the first sample. Um, and that's always going to be smaller than um, the single sample. So there is an advantage to using double sampling plans. If we apply the switching rules to double sampling plans, um, then we can get even more um, cost advantage. Um, now, the administrative cost goes up a little bit with the switching rules. But as I mentioned earlier, um, the knowledge you get about how your supplier processes are operating and um, the information um, that you use in order to may help you manage your suppliers is almost always um, far exceeds the administrative cost of keeping track of the lot history. Um, and so I always recommend that people implement the switching rules. 
And if you implement switching rules with double sampling plans, then you can actually get to reduced inspection on double sampling plans. If you can make the decision on the first sample, um, you can get a great advantage over um, sampling costs. So I always recommend that people rec implement double sampling and use the switching rules to get to reduced inspection, and that's, the, um, that's a low-cost approach for Z1.4. Now, we're going to compare this to what happens in the C equals zero plans because it's going to um, be a little bit different. So here's all the formulas. Um, if you want to um, implement these in Excel or any other program you can, um, I've given them here. We're not going to discuss them. They're just there for reference. So now we're going to turn our attention to the C equals zero plans. Um, we're going to look at Sequela's uh, book because that's, this is the common version. There's other people around that have um, different examples, and there's also a mill standard that um, has some sampling plans in it. But basically, we're going to use this as our example. Um, these are often called the C equals zero plans. Um, the Z1.4 plans are indexed by the AQL, um, and we talked about what that meant. Um, these C equals zero plans um, try to match the Z1.4 plans, but they match it at the point of um, what's sometimes called um, lot tolerance percent defective. We earlier called it uh, RQL, the rejectable quality limit. And we'll look at some graphs that show how these things compare. So remember um, our discussion of the um, operating characteristic curve. Produces risk has a value of alpha. We can find the 1 minus alpha um, point on the curve on, on the y-axis, and it gives us a corresponding um, percent non-conforming from the process on the x-axis. And similarly, we can find um, a, a consumer's risk, beta, um, on the x-axis, sorry, on the y-axis, and find the corresponding uh, point on the x-axis that tells us about the supplier's um, process level, how good or bad it has to be in order to be at that point. So this, this is what we learned earlier about the operating characteristic curve. Um, the C equals zero plans are indexed by the AQLs um, to make them comparable with the Z1.4 plans. Here's what he had in mind. Um, if you were using the Z1.4 plans and you were unhappy um, with this problem that we're going to describe here in a moment, you could switch to the C equals zero plans and you could plug them in exactly in the sense that what, if you've already picked the AQL, you can use the same AQL for the C equals zero plans. Now, the calculations in the book are a little bit different. They use something called a um, hypergeometric distribution for some technical reasons that are um, beyond the scope of this presentation. Z1.4 uses the binomial. Um, for the, our purposes, we're going to consider them to be the same, but if you're interested in the underlying statistical techniques, they are a little bit different. The C equals zero plans match the Z1.4 plans at the RQL points. In other words, what they're trying to do is pick the plans that have the same risk for you as the consumer. So the C equals zero plans are very strongly oriented toward the consumer. What they're trying to do is keep you from getting non-conforming lots um, because the producer's process is bad. So what they're trying to do is protect you as the, um, as the consumer of the process. So they're going to make the probabilities um, change. So here's what's going on with the plan. Now I picked a different one because um, I want than what I did in the earlier example because this really shows, um, shows the difference. So here's what's happening. I have a Z1.4 plan. My um, lot size is 1,300 pieces. I have an AQL of 4%. The sampling plan tells me to sample 125 pieces and accept on 10. So what this means is I'm going to reach into this lot of 1,300 pieces that just arrived. I'm going to take a simple random sample of 125 pieces. I'm going to classify each one as conforming or non-conforming and then I'm going to count the non-conforming ones. If it's 10 or fewer, I'm going to accept the lot. People have a very hard time with this concept. The problem that they're saying is, 
you mean that I would be willing to put this lot into stock even though I just found 10 non-conforming pieces? Um, this looks too risky to me. I don't like it. Um, you know, I, we didn't look at what's in the rest of the lot, so I really wonder how many non-conforming pieces are going to hit the production line. So this makes people nervous. The issue is addressed with the SQL zero plans. And so here's what happens with the SQL zero plans. I have the same incoming lot size, 1,300 pieces. I have the same AQL as the index to the plan. But what this plan says is I sample 18 pieces and I accept on zero. If I find one or more non-conforming items in the lot, I'm going to reject. So this is a very different plan. From the cost point of view, it's going to make the sample sizes go way down, and people like that. From the risk point of view, um, this intuitive sense of I don't want to have any non-conforming items in the sample because I don't know what's going on in the rest of the lot. Well, this SQL zero plans address that exact issue. Um, and here are the operating characteristic curves. So the one in black is the curve for Z1.4. And um, notice it's trying to approach this ideal curve that we looked at before. The C equals zero plan is in blue, and it falls off steeply. Now, notice that the plans cross. They cross at the RQL point. So they cross where the Excuse me, they cross where the consumer's risk is 10%, and that's what's going on right at this point. So um, this is exactly what we said would happen. They're going to cross at, uh, at 10% on the y-axis. Um, but notice what happens. The probability of acceptance for item for um, lot quality that's, le that's lower than the RQL point is always less with the C equals 1, C equals 0 plan than the Z1.4 plan. Um, and we'll look at that um, here in a moment, and we'll explain what that means. So between 0% nonconforming and, and the LTPD or the RQL, um, the C equals 0 plan is always going to reject more than um, the other plan. So let's look at this plan and see what happens when the process is operating at 2% non-conforming. So I'm going to move I'm going to move back to that plan. So 2% non-conforming. So it's going to be let's say roughly right in here. I'm going to reject um let's see. I've got it calculated here. I'm going to reject about 70%. Sorry, I'm going to accept about 70% of the lots that come from that plan if I use C equals 0. If I use Z1.4, I'm going to accept about 99% of the lots nearly 100%. Um, so what's going to happen is if I'm using the Z1.4 plans, I'm going to accept almost every lot that comes in because, remember, I said the AQL was 4%. So I'm well below 4% at 2% nonconforming. I'm going to accept almost every lot that gets shipped into me. If I use the C equals 0 plans, that's not what's going to happen. I'm only going to accept about 70% of the lots that come in if my if the process is operating at 2% non-conforming. So I'm going to see a major difference in the percentage of lots that I accept. Um, if I hold everything the same and change from Z1.4 to the corresponding SQL 0 plan, in this case that I just illustrated, this is what's going to happen. Um, the inspection costs are going to drop from 125 pieces to 18 pieces. If this is a complicated inspection, that could be substantial savings. The percentage of rejected lots is going to go from nearly zero to about 30%. Right? I'm going to accept 70%, so I'm going to reject 30%. Um, what that means is that you're going to have some issues with the supplier. If you switch the plans and nothing else changes, your supplier is going to go from almost 100% inspection of their incoming lots to only 70% um, acceptance of their incoming lots. They're going to go from looking like a really good supplier to looking like a really lousy supplier. And nothing in their process changed. They're still shipping you the same material. Nothing in your production process changed. You're still using it the same way, which changes the sampling plans. So what I always tell people, you need to think about what's going to happen. 
um, if you make this if you make this um, decision to switch. What's going to happen is suppliers that look really good before may potentially look really bad afterwards. You're going to reject a lot more lots than you were before. If you reject those lots and you send them back to the supplier for them to do some um, sorting and, and uh, repair or replacement of the non-conforming items in the lot, you run the risk of starving your inventory. So I always suggest to people that if you're considering going from Z1.4 to the C equals zero plans, you think about what's going to happen. You make sure that you have enough inventory to protect yourself or you have enough plans in place that you're willing to sort the lots that you reject in order to keep your production line going. So there are advantages to the C equals zero plans, but you can't just switch overnight. You have to plan in advance. Um, and you have to understand what's going to happen, and that's part of what we just explained. Now, some people like to use switching rules in C equals zero, and they're perfectly acceptable. They're not required, but the, um, the, the book discusses them, and they offer them as an option. And so what they suggest is for um, tightened, you go to the next lower AQL value. For reduced, you go to the next higher AQL value. You've got a set of tables. And so you can move yourself around in those plans. Um, and basically, they're suggesting the same switching rules. Um, normal to tightened is 2 out of 5. Untightened and normal is um, 5 out of 5 accepted. Normal to reduced is 10 out of 10. So you can get, again, a set of uh, cost advantages by looking at a smaller sample sizes and the second set of cost advantages by um, accepting their offer of switching rules. Um, and you can, for good incoming quality, you can actually um, get good insurance with lower um, inspection costs. So, summary and conclusions. Um, we looked at four important curves. They tell us how these plans operate. The operating characteristic curve is the probability of accepting lots based upon um, the producer's um, quality. What this means is that you need to understand the operating characteristic curve for any plan that you're going to use um, because it's going to tell you how this plan operates. It's basically the description of your insurance policy, if you want to think of it that way. We looked at the average sample number plan. Um, it tells you, on average, how many pieces you're going to pick in the samples. If it's a single sampling plan, it's always going to be the same. If it's a double sampling plan, you're almost always going to, and you're in Z1.4, you're almost always going to be um, looking at, on average, fewer, um, a smaller sample size than with the single plans. And then if you need to do rectifying inspection, the average outgoing quality and the average total inspected plans are curves. We'll tell you how those things operate. Uh, rectifying inspection is really valuable technique when your processes are not capable. When you get your processes capable, give up on um, rectifying inspection. It's costly. You only do it um, because you absolutely need to. Z1.4 offers a huge variety of sampling plans, um, single, double, and multiple. Um, they adjust themselves dynamically based upon the history. This is the switching rules, and they offer these so-called levels of discrimination. What this means is that you can switch your operating characteristic curve based upon what's trying to happen. So for example, you'd want to um, do something different if you have destructive testing than if you have non-destructive at incoming inspection. Um, it uses the binomial distribution for all of the things we've talked about. There are some cases where it uses the Poisson. We didn't get into that. The C equals zero plan addressed this common criticism of Z1.4. That is, you can accept a lot with non-conforming material in the sample. This bothers people. The C equals zero plans address those issues. Um, all the plans uh, have C equals zero, so you only need to know the sample size. So um, it's, uh, you get the sample size, and C equals zero and R equals one, if you cast it in the way we did with C1.4. The sample sizes tend to be much smaller than the corresponding Z1.4 plans. The underlying distribution is a little bit different, but it matches the Z1.4 plans at the RQL points. And to make it easy to use, these plans are indexed by the same values as the Z1.4 plans, the idea being that um, this is a direct substitution 
for the plans, but remember the warning I gave you, you just can't switch overnight. You may potentially be rejecting a lot more material than you would have otherwise, so you need to worry about um, what your inventory position is going to be if you, if you make the switch. Our conclusions, attribute sampling is a powerful tool. Um, it has a function like any tool. Do not use it for process control. Use it when your processes are out of control, for example, with rectifying inspection, or when your processes aren't capable, I should say. Utilize it to give you some insurance so that you protect yourself against um, external suppliers' processes. There's lots of methods out there. We looked at two common ones, Z1.4 and C equals zero. Both sets are described by the operating characteristic curves. And the deciding factors about how you want to go with either the plans or the details inside the plans depends upon the level of protection you need um, and the cost of doing the inspection. So uh, we're going to open it up for questions, so I'm going to turn it back to our host. Um, if there's any questions that we weren't able to answer, you can contact me through a global compliance panel, um, and I'll be happy to respond. If you have any questions in particular about how to use the um, sampling plans, the tables in Z1.4, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions. So we'll turn it back to our host. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for that wonderful presentation. I'd just like to thank our attendees also for having cooperating with us so far. It's uh, time for the Q&A to begin, and we request all who have questions uh, for our presenter to click on the raise hand icon. Uh, I'll just show you how that works. It is a palm-like icon um, that will appear beside your name. Uh, you could see a palm-like icon beside my name. Once you do click on that, I could go ahead, unmute your line, and you could ask your questions directly or verbally to Dan. Or else, uh, we have the, the option of posting your questions. You could either post it in the Q&A panel or send me a chat message with your question, which I will forward on to Dan. Uh, meanwhile, we also request you to share your feedback in the feedback in the polling panel that will appear on your screen right now. The polling panel has just about eight questions, mostly multiple choice in nature, and it wouldn't take you more than two minutes of your time to answer it. Uh, we'd be grateful if you could uh, stay back a little longer and complete the feedback for us. Uh, right now, we are willing to take any questions. I did receive a chat message early on. Uh, Dan, I'll just send that over in the chat panel. Okay. All right, just give me a second. Here we go. Okay, uh, so the question is, um, what would be a compelling reason other than cost um, to use special inspection levels? The special inspection levels um, usually end up um, being applied to destructive testing. Uh, we saw some examples here where we had relatively large sample sizes um, using level two, uh, large sample sizes compared to the size of the lot. Um, if you're doing destructive testing or if the sampling is very, very expensive, uh, you'd probably want to use the special levels. Um, now, you need to understand what happens with the operating characteristic curves, but generally the special levels will have you um, lower the sample sizes but they will also change the risk structure. So that's where they're normally used um, when you need to have uh, small sample sizes because you either have destructive testing or you, your inspection process is very, very expensive. Okay, then uh, we have one more question uh, through the chat. I'll just send that over as well. Okay. Uh, why do you convert variable inspection data to attribute in the first place? Um, well, that's the, that's the way the sampling plan works. Now, what we've done is, is we've picked um, an attribute sampling plan. So what this means is we need to, con we need to know, um, we need to classify each part as either conforming or non-conforming. There's another whole set of sampling plans. They're described in a document called Z1.4. And um, they are variable sampling plans, and they use the data that you might actually measure um, as a basis for um, the inspection. They're much more complicated to use than the attribute sampling plans. Um, you need to do a lot of calculations, and some funny things can happen because what you're doing is looking at the distribution of the, um, the data that you collect in the sample um, 
and see how it matches to the normal distribution. So they're complicated to use. Um, they are um, confusing. And so oftentimes what happens is people um, just convert the variables data that they collect into um, attributes data. The other thing that happens is that um, sometimes you make a measurement and you only get attributes data. So you could, for example, um, have a go, no go gauge. And this often happens with uh, threaded pieces, for example, or things of a certain size. Um, you have two sets of gauges, and you take the part and um, you compare it, you measure it with the go gauge, and you measure it with the no go gauge, and you answer the question, is it conforming or not, without actually taking the variables data. Um, that would be a good place for attribute sampling. And then sometimes things are just attributes. You're looking at color, for example. Um, the supplier has three options. They could ship you red, yellow, or green. Um, and you want to make sure that you're getting the right one and you only want green ones. So um, you start with an attribute to begin with. So that's usually what happens um, is people find attribute sampling plans easier. So they convert variables to attributes in order to apply um, the more simple plan, or you end up with only attributes data to begin with. But the first reason is the reason to convert variables to attributes. It makes the whole sampling situation um, considerably easier. OK. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, I'll just go ahead. Uh, we have a raise hand by, from John. I'll just go ahead and unmute his line. OK. Uh, right. Go ahead, John. Your line is open. On slide 32 for stratified sampling. Yeah, just give me a moment to get there. But go ahead and ask your question. You have 50 boxes of 100 batteries. Would you apply the plan by first going to the 50 boxes and selecting happens to be eight, and then from the hundred within there, selecting the yep. number according to the plan? Yep, yep. That's the way people usually do it. Um, or what they often do is take the square root of the number of boxes um, in order to pick the number of boxes to, uh, to sample, and then they open up those boxes and they take, um, you know, let's say you're looking for 100 pieces and, and you end up with uh, um, this is going to work, but you end up with five boxes. You take 20 out of each box. That's normally the way people do it when they run into this problem. Um, and, and all I'm suggesting is that technically that's incorrect. Practically, that's the way it really works, and it is going to make a big difference. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, once again, uh, Dan, I'll just send some questions over in the chat panel. This is from okay. Jessica. Uh, what is the typical AQL level recognized by the FDA? Um, does the FDA prefer C equals zero or um, Z1.4? Um, the FDA is never going to tell you what the AQL is. Um, they're going to assume that you understand it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm a device guy, so I'm going to assume we're talking about medical devices, not pharmaceuticals or biologics or stuff like that. So um, they're never going to tell you what the AQL should be. They are going to um, expect you to have a, a statistical rationale, um, and it's in the um, medical device regulations, QSR, A20.250, says um, if you have sampling plans, you have to have um, a statistical rationale for utilizing them. So F FDA will never tell you what the AQL is going to be. You're going to have to pick that based upon your processes. but. Um, they're going to expect that you've got a good reason for picking the AQL you did, and that if you use any one of these plans, you're going to follow the plan the way it was written. Now, um, they don't have a preference for either one of these plans. And in fact, the C equals zero plans are not a recognized consensus standard. Um, and you can use them. That's fine, because they have all of the underlying statistical rationale, so they satisfy the requirements for A20.50. But I will tell you, I've seen some cases, seen warning letters um, and cases where um, FDA would question a sampling plan with acceptance number larger than zero. Or, and so for example, if you're doing um, design verification or validation and you had 
some unit fail and you said, well, that's okay because that's the way my sampling plan works, they might have some questions about that. And also, if you're doing process validation, 820.75, um, and you're getting um, a reasonably large number of failing units, then they would question whether or not your process is um, has really been validated. So there are some cases in which their expectation and your expectation equally should be that you're not going to get any non-conforming units. But as long as you have the sampling plan set up correctly and you understand what the underlying statistical technique is, FDA should accept it either way. But as I say, there are some cases where if you had, in this last example, I think I had 1,300 units and the Z1.4 plan was 10 non-conforming. If you were doing a process validation, you had 10 non-conforming units, I would question, and the FDA will question, whether or not your process validation was adequate. So I hope, I hope that addresses the, the questions here. Okay, uh, next question we have, uh, okay, uh, let's send that over also through the chat okay. panel. Okay, on page 29, what process can you use to go from reduce sampling to skip lot? Okay, oh good, thank you. So there's 29. Um, if you use Z1.4 the way it's written, um, then you never go to skip lot sampling. But there is another standard, um, it's ANSI ASQ S1, if memory serves correctly, that tells you um, how to go from normal to skip lot um, instead of reduced. So what it does is, is essentially um, adds you into, um, um, sorry, it basically takes out the reduced and substitutes uh, skip lot sampling. So if you're interested in doing skip lot sampling in a, in a Z1.4 context, go find yourself a copy of S1. Um, and then it tells you how to set up skip lot sampling. And then it moves you through skip lots so that um, instead of looking at every lot, you can go to half the lots that come in and then down to a quarter of the lots. I think it moves in steps of a half, if I remember right. So you can go from uh, one half to one quarter to one eighth to one sixteenth um, if you've got really good history. So that's another valuable um, technique. There's a lot of things you have to set up. There's a lot of mechanism to make it all work, but that's what happens with uh, with skip lot. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, we have another two questions in the Q&A uh, panel. I'll just send both over. Okay. Um, I just got up and I'm standing at my uh, bookshelf. Yes. Um, it, uh, just to follow up on that last one, um, the plan is, the standard is uh, ANSI ASQC S1. 1996 is the version that I have in my hand. It's called an Attribute Skip Lot Sampling Program. Um, and what it does is it uh, it, mat it lines up with the Z1.4 to get you to skip lots instead of reduced. Okay, now, uh, two more questions in the chat panel. Okay. Um, long form of IQL is all it says. I'm not sure what that means. Um, and then the second one is how appropriate is double sampling in um, the pharmaceutical industry? Um, well, Double sampling is a technique um, where, where any time that you find attribute sampling acceptable, so in the pharmaceutical industry, I think, for example, of, uh, of making pills or tablets, and there are, ca there are characteristics that you're interested in um, of, the char of, the, um, of the pill, like how long does it take to dissolve in water and, and what kind of force does it take to crush it. Um, those are all things that you might measure as variables and convert them to attributes just as we did before and apply an attribute sampling plan. Anytime you have an attribute sampling plan, um, in general, I mean, there might be some industry reasons not to do this, but in general, anytime you have an attribute sampling plan, you can use Z1.4 and you have a choice of um, single, double, or multiple sampling. So. Wherever you have attribute sampling plan in the pharmaceutical industry, 
to the best of my knowledge, double sampling plans would be acceptable. So the real question is, is an attribute plan acceptable? And then beyond that, it's, it's a technical detail of attribute sampling. So I hope that helps. Okay, Dan, uh, it seems we have one more question in the chat. I'll just send that over as well. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so the question is, is ISO 2859-1-1999 equivalent to Z1.4? Um, I believe the answer is yes. Um, I didn't mention this um, in the in the presentation, but there is a set of sampling plans that are published by ISO, um, and there's a set of attribute sampling plans, and um, 2859 looks like the right number, um, and the dash one plan is equivalent to Z1.4 if I remember exactly how this works. There's about five in there, but I, but I believe the answer is yes, and um, the corresponding ISO plan is also recognized by the FDA as an acceptable plan. So for attribute sampling, they'll take Z1.4 or ISO 2859-1. The 1999 doesn't look right to me. There might be a later version, but I don't think the, um, the plans have changed. It might be the similar case with, um, in which ISO reaffirms the standards every five years. Um, but I do not believe that anything in the details of the plans have changed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that uh, question, answering the question as well. Uh, so far, I don't see any further questions. Uh, would you like me to wait for about another two minutes, Dan? Um, well, let me let me start to sum up. And if anybody has a question or wants to chime in, um, feel free. Oh, I see. I see a hand raise. It's John Cummings. Is that still? Uh, the, is that an active that's question? That's been answered, Dan. Okay. Uh, that's um, been answered. Okay. So, um, what what I'm suggesting here is that um, attribute sampling is a powerful technique that allows you to do um, some things. Um, that are important in a quality management system. Um, the two things that we've looked at that are really important is to protect yourself against a supplier's process. It doesn't have to be an external supplier. Um, or rectifying inspection when you don't have a total picture of um, when, when your process is not fully capable and you want to protect your customer from the incapable process, then you can do screening inspections. Um, it is not statistical process control, so don't try to use it in place of statistical process control. You should have uh, good processes that are well operated. Um, Z1.4 is the most common case that you'll see. Um, it's got a lot of information and in it. It just has a variety of, um, of plans. The good news is that you can do a lot with it. The bad news is it makes it a little bit complicated in order to run it. Um, and it has acceptance numbers that are not always zero. People find that to be a bit of a problem. So the C equals zero plans address those issues. So attribute sampling is a powerful technique. Um, I hope you'll understand it a lot more um, as a result of this webinar. And if you have any questions that come up later, feel free to contact me through Global Compliance Panel, and I'll be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Dan. I don't uh think we have any further questions. Uh, like you have mentioned, if there are any further questions, uh, our attendees can send them to me um, through the email. You could send all the questions to either me or the generic email that we have. That's webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com. Also, we have a list of uh, past webinars from uh, Dan O'Leary. We have, uh, uh, for more details, you could always visit our, our website and uh, access the other webinars that have been uh, done by Dan O'Leary in the past. Uh, Dan, with your permission, may I go ahead and conclude the session for you? Yes, let's do that. Thank you so much. Uh, we are grateful for all of our attendees for having taken part in this webinar. And if you would like to get in touch with us, you could uh, send us an email to webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com. If any of you feel that your team members, your colleagues, or friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it will be available in the recorded format and can be purchased from our website. Or you can call us at one 800 
We do welcome your suggestion and feedback or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. If you would like to suggest a topic or desire customized corporate training online or off-site, we ensure that whatever is your training necessity, it will be our priority. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon and for your continued patronage. On behalf of our presenter, Mr. Dan O'Leary and the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to say thank you for participating in this webinar and we do wish you a pleasant day ahead.